performance space and trying to preserve what we're doing. So, so we went and we made a Meet the Candidates forum last week and we had 18 city council candidates show up for it, uh, which was really great. We had four from District 2, which is the East Village in that area. We had a bunch from District 4. We had two really great ones from District 35, which is around Fort Greene. So that's going to be an interesting race to watch for those that are interested in the arts. So we're going to make our endorsements around April the 20th. And, and you can follow all about this on our website, litny.org. So uh, I'd like to just open it up while I have a minute or two left uh, for any questions anybody has about what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Our or organization was started <clears throat> around about 2009. Uh, the actual genesis of the idea was 2005 um, when uh, a fellow named Kirkwood Bromley was given the Joe Chino Award uh, at the New York uh, Innovative Theater Awards. And he said, we shouldn't be calling ourselves off off Broadway. We shouldn't relate ourselves to some other avenue. So indie film won't say they're off, off Hollywood. So we shouldn't do that either. We're independent, we're artist driven, we're artist centric, we're artist creative. So then the big thing also at around about that time was we were seeing a lot of our spaces close. And this is right before the big financial crisis that happened in 2009 and we were still losing spaces to a great, great degree. I would hazard we've lost about 100 spaces since the latest turn of the century. Um, so that's really difficult for us. Um, so that's, that's where it started. We also focus on things like the uh, Actors' Equity Showcase Code. If you know anything about that, that's, uh, it's got some good things for actors. I'm an actual member of Actors' Equity, but also some problems with trying to sustain a successful run for longer than three weeks. So it's things of that nature. Um, and, and we just really didn't have a unified voice. Since we started the organization, we we've broken off into several organizations. They're one of our sister organizations, the Indie Theater Fund, represented by Randy Berry here. Um, they, they do a really great thing of, of taking uh, funds from organizations that are part of the company who give five cents a ticket, and they create a pool of money to give out grants uh, annually. So they, they do a great thing for, with that. But we're separate from that. We're focusing on really hardcore you know, if we have space, we'll put up a show. When we don't have space, we're in trouble. That's, that's our big thing at the moment. Yes, ma'am. Um, great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think there, there's, there's, I think from, uh, from our point of view, there's a lot of things that get looked at as far as what's happening with, with organizations that have budgets of 250,000 and above. And most of our organizations are, are with groups that have less than that, much less than that. And I think that we also are dealing with organizations that, for the most part, we, uh, most of our companies last two to maybe three years because of all the pressures that are happening. So it's just really hard for us to, to have any kind of traction and have a unified voice in what's happening. We, it would be great to open up the cultural institutions groups and to, and to have more funding for us as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Both, <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next up, David Scheingold from Arts Pool. Did I get that right? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so great to be here, um, even with this intimate group. Um, and the recommendation that I wanted to make to the city as a part of its cultural plan process 
is to make some serious investments in shared infrastructure for the arts field. Reason being, um, we as a field don't have a whole lot of money and never have, and it does not appear there's a golden parachute on its way. Um, and yet, we all tend to go down the road of building independent infrastructure in the form of our own space, our own staff, our own technology. That is, tends to be the most expensive way to have infrastructure. So we're spreading out our limited dollars even farther by, sub, by dividing and having independent infrastructure. So the opportunity in shared infrastructure is not just to save money, but to save, save time invested in maintaining that infrastructure and to create the opportunity to reinvest those savings in the mission-driven work that brought us all to this field and is the basis of the impact that we have on society. So to give the example of Arts Pool in terms of how we do this work, um, we were originally incubated by the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York. And when we were first developing Arts Pool, what we knew was that relative to the equation of space, staff, and technology, we wanted to focus on the labor and technology sides of that equation. Um, and we also knew that in terms of the administrative work that we wanted to create a shared infrastructure around, we needed to find aspects of that work that we do in approximately the same way from organization to organization, and that involve a lot of redundant transactional work, because that's the basic profile of work that you can gain efficiencies on and over time achieve economies of scale through. So where we landed in terms of the offering um, includes compliance, because we all have to be compliant in approximately the same way from organization to organization. And it also includes the administrative functions that rest underneath compliance, which are finance and workforce administration, all of which involve quite a bit of redundant transactional work. So um, when an arts organization joins Arts Pool, the infrastructure that they're sharing with the other members is a group of worker and workers and a suite of technology that's delivering their compliance, finance, and workforce administration functions. Um, and we launched in December of 2014. In that transition, Art New York went from incubator to first member of Arts Pool, and we've been growing that membership incrementally ever since. We now have a membership of 13 organizations, and to give you a sense of those organizations, they are producing, presenting, service, education, and funding organizations. They support all arts genres. They have presence and reach locally, nationally, and internationally. They range in budget sizes from 100,000 to 5.5 million. And the reason I point that out is because it's so often the case that we stay in silos as a field in, in relationship to the organizations and the artists that are most similar to us. But we as a field need the same basic infrastructure and we use it in the same basic ways. And so shared infrastructure also creates the opportunity to collaborate across those silos that we typically isolate ourselves in. Um, so, I have two minutes, I did that fast. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the basics here. Obviously, you know, we are one version of this. There are other versions of this, some that are addressing space, some that are addressing other kinds of infrastructure and sharing opportunities. We would encourage the city to invest widely um, in these efforts. And with one minute left, if anybody has a quick question, I'm happy to answer it. Okay. Oh. In funding, um, general operating support is always best because what we need is to build our own infrastructure so that we can bring on more members. Sure, it could work either way, but the truth about our model is that the faster we can scale, the faster we can create efficiencies that drive down cost, 
which then open our doors to a wider array of organizations. So certainly the support in either direction would be useful, but if we can't scale up our own operations, we can't open our doors that widely to bring on new organizations. So I think the, the general operating support toward arts pool would be more valuable to meet both goals. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, let's see, next up we have Wiley Hassam. Hello. Um, I wasn't here this morning, so um, I may say something that is irrelevant or you've bypassed it. Uh, my name is Wiley Hausam. I'm uh, kind of a career long arts worker uh, in many, well, in several different disciplines and in different roles. First part of my career, I was an artist representative working in the theater. Um, second part, I was a theater producer working at the Public Theater under George C. Wolfe, and during that time we opened Joe's Pub. Third chapter is as a university arts administrator, um, and I opened the Skirball Center at NYU in 2003, I guess it was. Um, so this idea is just in the interest of, um, of spreading, spreading resources and covering more New Yorkers and serving more New Yorkers. And it's sort of borrowed from um, a system that I don't know that much about, but uh, have heard about in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And essentially what it is, is just a, a network of small, locally, deeply embedded art centers that serve artists in that locality, that neighborhood. Um, and um, would be funded by a combination of the DCA and city council members responsible for that neighborhood in the city. Um, and it sort of stems from the thought that, you know, we, we have this definition, a longstanding definition of what is valuable arts and culture in New York City, and it tends to be the large cultural organizations and the traditional disciplines. And a lot of those organizations are becoming unsustainable, financially unsustainable. I mean, we're talking about the New York Philharmonic, the Metropolitan Opera, um, the Metropolitan Museum. They're all showing great signs of financial difficulty in the future. And, and the current arts uh, construction or ecosystem really serves a very small portion of, the New, of New York City. And so the idea would be to try to serve, you know, ideally 100% of, of folks through very close to the ground, inexpensive uh, support systems. And that's really my idea. And uh, I'll answer questions, although I don't know that I uh, have any answers. Hi. Just to say a little bit about the Sao Paulo model, it's run by Seski, it's called. And it's an interesting model, the, um, I think in the 60s, the kind of left-wing government came up with that great idea that every company in Sao Paulo has to pay 1.5% or 1% of their profits into a pool. Uh, from that pool, like 25 theaters have been built, but they are not just theaters, they are big buildings and they have a theater in the middle, then they have a gym, then they have a pool, they have a library, they have a restaurant, and they have uh, concert spaces. If you are employed by any of the companies, you go in everywhere for free. So this is your, uh, they have lots of uh, continuing education classes, um, all uh, winter long, summer long, spring, and the evenings with certificates, without certificates. And, um, and then if you are a member of, of, you live in Sao Paulo, you go there, but for a very small amount, like for $20 you go, or $15 to, the, to see the play, or the pool costs you $5 a visit. And um, supposedly 55 to 60% each year of everybody who lives in Sao Paulo uses these institutions. So it's a sensational model, very, very successful. They rebuild old factories. Uh, one is called Pompeii um, by a famous artist and uh, architect who redid that. So it's a, a completely different approach, but it really does does work. And they might not have the Met or they might not have the uh, Metropolitan Museum, but they have this. And it's sensational. 25 theaters um, supported by this. Yeah, and not by the city in that time, but through the businesses.
question, but um, I resound with you. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a fellow NYU um, grad. Um, but um, even recently, uh, I mean, I've been attending a lot of these events, and I keep thinking everybody talks about a cultural plan for the Lower East Side, and I, I know there are areas which need money and culture, um, cultural centers. But I also think about the well-developed parts of New York City, which is like areas close to Lincoln Center and um, you know Philharmonic, because there are still communities there which don't have the real cultural experience. And so this idea of having this small cultural space, you know, where even, I mean, the people there may be rich, but they started off poor. They came, you know, they're living in this middle class society and being rich can also be very alienating. And uh, I mean, so having these cultural centers and having a provision for that um, is something, uh, you know, when you were talking about that point, I was like, yeah, okay, someone is thinking like me. <laughs> Well, it, it would increase, um, you know, in-person connectivity by neighborhoods. I've been very active in um, a lot of, um, oh, 30 seconds, of political uh, meetings in the last several months. And what I've noticed is that people really like coming to be with other people in those kinds of intimate, interactive ways because people are connecting in a way that is so hard to do with electronics. Hi, you know, there are a lot of community art centers in New York and all the different boroughs, but I just think that we, even us in the arts, don't even know about them. Like Queens Library, for example, is that place you're talking about. It's a library, it's a community center, they present art and cultural events there, and it's also a meeting place for people in the community. So what I think we talked about in our meeting this morning, which is the manifesto, is, you know, how to let people know that this is happening. It's, you know, I think there's always this assumption that a neighborhood is nothing until it's gentrified. You know, oh, finally, you know, people are here, but we, there are people, you know, I, I call them indigenous New Yorkers, people that were born here, that didn't come here for any reason, that are here because this is where they live, and they're part of the fabric. So even in your, you know, you th it does happen, it, do it is here. Well, actually, can I have uh, Patrick Grant, is that? Uh, Tilted Axis? Yeah? Too far away from the stand, because you're going to find yourself in that situation. <laughs> and I myself uh, wouldn't mind you. This is where I ask myself, uh, what am I doing here in doing this uh, for two reasons. My name is Patrick Grant, and I'm, um, I'm a composer and a musician and a producer. My background has been primarily in theater, um, even though I have created music with diverse artists like John Cage, Billy Joel, Philip Glass, Quincy Jones. So, but I'm coming at it um, from a perspective of a uh, two paths. One is I want to um, rehabilitate myself to the community and say hello everybody. I uh, want to make myself more active in my own um, city's art community. And then secondly, to quickly tell you about a project I've been doing for the last five years, sort of off the grid, that has had some good results that maybe you could um, use these examples um, as metaphors or direct application if they're helpful in any way. So this, uh, what I'm speaking for is I'm speaking for music, and music is a art that doesn't necessarily need words, so it has to be given a voice. But what I have found is that where there is music, there is hope. And what I have done is I've created a project called Tilted Axes Music for Mobile Electric Guitars, and I created this for Make Music New York five years ago. And the idea was I was gonna combine my history of theatricality, rock musicianship and um, sense of community and create a project where it sort of was my revenge. Yeah, we would always put on shows and hope that people would come and see us. Well, 
let's put together something where we can go where there's already thousands of people. And so that's been um, a great experience. It's uh, found resonance not only in this city, uh, but other cities in this country, as well as uh, in Europe and South America. So I'm very familiar with the SESCI um, system, and they're fantastic, even though they lost 37% of their funding um, this last year. But how do I fund this thing? So one of the things I, uh, working off the grid, is I want to encourage the DCA to find alternative methods to find corporate funding. What I was doing was, um, since we use musical equipment like box amps or strings by Fender, I would um, go to companies, and this could be maybe not a music company, but whatever you're interested in, find out what they're already spending money on, and then tell them how you can you know, get the same result um, for whatever they're spending, maybe cheaper. So for instance, I knew that the Vox was taking out you know, maybe 40, um, spending money on ads to reach like 40, 50,000 people in certain uh, miracle, um, in certain musical periodicals. So I said, well, if we do a performance in Union Square or some other big city, I can reach that same amount of people showing people your logo. So automatically, that action became monetized. So I was able to start to approach people like, so there was a value to all these things we were doing. So it's, in a nutshell, with two minutes left, these are the kinds of approaches and the kind of initiative I've encouraged. I mean, I know a lot of corporations are offering um, um, money for the arts, but my advice is to take the initiative to call up their, um, their development people. You will probably find a colleague who is much like you, whose their job is to go back to their boss with some cool new ideas, and more often than not, I find out uh, they're starving for ideas. So don't wait for them to come to you, but pick up the, the phone and take the initiative, and then you will find some success, <laughs> but it's better than no success. But I, um, that's what I have. And I also, because I don't have, um, I'll leave, uh, I'll let the music speak for itself. I bought a bunch of CDs I'll leave out there if you want to. And um, that will explain the project more deeply. But I guess with one minute, is there any burning question or anything I can clarify? Well, one of the reasons is it would also enable me to um, go into communities that needed arts the most, and that's one of the things we like doing. We, go, we like going into what we call war zones. We've done a lot of work in Detroit, and we've done a lot of work in Sao Paulo and other um, neighborhoods of uh, Dusseldorf, which is mostly nice, but there are, if you go far enough away, you'll find areas that aren't getting the support they need, and we also encourage people from the communities to join us with um, some preparation in the rehearsal process so every project we do takes on the flavor um, of that community. So that's one of the um, things that have made the project, I think, uh, uh, very special. So every incarnation takes on the character of the community in which it performs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> next up, we have Marianne Benedetto from Sparrow Film Project. Hi, so I'm... <clears throat> excuse me. I'm with the Sparrow Film Project, which is a local filmmaking community... Uh, I'm clearly one of the first speakers not from the theater community, so <laughs> excuse me. Um, we're a local filmmaking competition. We started in the spring of 2009 and have since run 13 major events and additional smaller ones. Uh, our basic premise uh, has remained the same throughout. We give uh, a challenge each year that's based on a theme, and filmmakers who uh, sign up in advance are uh, given their specific assignments, which they must complete in a three-minute film uh, that is due three weeks after the assignment is given out. Uh, we have always stri uh, striven to give something in, is an inclusive opportunity to our community. Um, we are from Astoria, which was one of the earliest homes of filmmaking after it moved out of Edison, New Jersey, uh, at, where it was just a technological achievement. Um, films were made here in New York. Um, television is made here in New York now. There are over 50 films that are, sh uh, 50 shows that are shooting every year. 
Um, but we want people to think of filmmaking and television and all of these, these creative opportunities as not just something that you see a no parking sign and then there's a grip truck on, in front of your deli and you know, it's just a nuisance. Um, we want people to be able to just get in there and experience what it's like to make a film, um, what it's like to meet other people who will help you um, realize this, uh, um, this dream that you have. And our co competitors have been amateurs, they've been people who are, um, are involved in, in filmmaking professionally. Um, we have had people who, uh, who are young. Our most recent Best Actress winner was eight years old at the time of filming. Our, our most recent um, Best Actor was in his uh, 70s. Um, we've had people who are hearing impaired, who are vision impaired. Uh, I myself am a, am a queer woman and we have had people from the LGBT community. One of our, our best film winners um, made a film specifically about violence against uh, gay men. And we, so what we do is we do this uh, competition every year and we're also trying to expand because not only are we trying to say that we have an opportunity for anybody to come out and make a film, but we want to give people resources um, in doing so. I work in uh, post-production primarily. I'm a colorist uh, for a show you may have heard of called Sesame Street, um, alongside my partner, who is also a cinematographer. Uh, we have, uh, so we have been doing educational uh, programs now where we do um, inexpensive workshops. Uh, we you know, speak about different topics that people may not consider um, accessible without going to film school and spending a lot of money. Uh, we have reached out to uh, editors who have worked on major motion pictures, um, sound designers, just different people who, hey, maybe if you'd like to make a film, you don't know what your talent is or what you might be good at or you know how to fill in the gaps. So we're giving people these opportunities. Um, we also are trying to bring people together. Uh, we've had m former participants who have moved out of New York City who have expanded um, our reach by you know, moving to, they've moved to, Louisiana or Colorado and they bring it with them. They sign up online and they get locals there to take part. Um, but we are primarily about New York City and about creating um, this environment. So we have mixers that we hold at bars where we just invite people to come down and meet other people they might um, join a team with or talk about um, challenges that they've had and just, you know, just speak out and you know, form a larger, tighter knit community. Um, it's in terms of budget, we, are a small group, there's five of us. Um, we do this all on a volunteer basis. And it's, you know, it's a challenge, but we've been lucky that we've had um, help from Kaufman and uh, Studios and also the Museum of the Moving Image uh, who, who, who have given us the space to show every film that we make over the course of two days. And then we host a gala celebration and award ceremony um, in their beautiful facility. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's the, our challenge is is figuring out funding and resources. Are any questions? <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot to get through. Yes. Um, <coughs> since I don't know much about the film um, industry landscape or geography of mm -hmm. how creating resources and funding <coughs> can work, um, what, do you have any concrete um, suggestions you would make to the department of cultural affairs on how they can um, get these resources to work together? I mean, it, it would be very helpful for a non-biased source of support. Um, we've spoken, and we reach out to um, potential corporate sponsors, um, but there's always the fear, especially since we have this um, sort of background where it started out of a bar, um, that's what Sparrow is, and we don't want to have, say, um, liquor brand X presents this, um, this uh, this competition where we create the assignments that people have and we're afraid of having corporate sponsorship become like part of your assignment is you must put a bottle of that, you know, of that liquor in there and so forth. So, you know, any sort of like a corporate, um, you know, any, if it's corporate money for it's, if it's city money, something that we know isn't going to force our, um, our, our filmmakers to, you know, be biased in, in some way or create something that's in some way inherently advertising. And that's time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. Um, so let's see, we had five people on this list. I know some um, other people have joined us since then. 
if anybody um, either, uh, has a um, uh, talk that they would like to present about their own group or um, proposals to the plan, you're more than welcome to come up. We could uh, do it maybe assembly line style um, uh, up at the front. And, um, and then maybe uh, after that, we can open it to uh, small group conversations or um, uh, impressions from the uh, morning breakout sessions and things like that. So anybody else would like to come up? Uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm Alec Duffy. I'm the co-director of the Art Center Jack, which is in Clinton Hill. We started about five years ago. I'm going to use the podium. <laughs> I'm going to get really formal here, just because I have some notes on my computer. Um, so last week, the activist Mark Rudd led a workshop at Jack, and in talking about his time as a student activist in the 1960s, he said that he felt like the present moment was a second opening. The first for him being 1968. And um, I don't know about you, but I feel an opening myself right now. And it's clear that DCLA does too. Uh, they did the diversity survey two years ago or one year ago and the cultural plan this year, um, kind of opening up an opportunity to look at the how, the why, the what, the where, and the, and the um, who of cultural funding in New York. Um, when I was looking at the findings overview from the diversity survey, there was something that caught my eye. Uh, they surveyed all the organizations that they had funded in the past few years. And <laughs> in their findings overview, they reported that 74% of the leaders in the cultural workforce were white. But I wish they had written that 74% of the leaders of the cultural organizations that they funded were white. Uh, the cultural workforces, the workforce encompasses so many other groups and individuals that the DC then those that the DCLA currently funds. I was talking yesterday with Diera Wright, our co-founder at Jack, and she told me that 10 years ago, when she started her own arts organization, Gather Brooklyn, she started it as a for-profit enterprise, mostly because she didn't feel comfortable with the bureaucratic hurdles and red tape that came with being a nonprofit. She preferred her, her organization to remain autonomous. We have to admit that there's a lot of trauma around the nonprofit industrial process and grant making. And we have right now an opportunity to examine the process of eligibility and the application for DCLA funding itself. In what ways does it reflect and reward white organizational culture over those who have less capacity and resources to fully meet all the demands of their process? Um, I wanted to let you know that a few of us are putting together something like a 10-point proposal to revise the funding guidelines and application to ensure that the DCLA umbrella is more inclusive channeling resources to those who are doing great work but for whom the trauma of an application to DCLA is a non-starter. Some of the things we're looking at is, three minutes. Some of the things that we're looking at is, um, first off, eligibility, the rule that you have to be in, in existence for over two years prior to applying. Those first two years are, are, are the years in which you, that decide whether you survive or die. And the only reason Jack was able to get through two years is because my wife and I had put in $75,000 of our own money, our life savings, into Jack in order to get it past that hump before we were eligible for significant funding, even though we're not getting that yet, but significant funding through the DCLA. How many folks have the opportunity to do that? Um, what we're looking at is opportunities for seed funding for just that purpose. Uh, what if the DCLA put significant resources, not, not just the you know, $50,000 cap for organizations un, under $250,000 budget, but even more, $100,000 seed funding to arts entrepreneurs that want to start organizations. Uh, number two, simplifying the application. It took me about 40 hours to complete, uh, but for someone working two to three jobs, that's an impossibility. Um, reviewing the panel process. So one of the things that came up with someone I talked to who had been on the panel was, that each year they, they, they tell you in the panel how much that person was granted the previous, or that organization was granted the previous year. And what that does is kind of inflect a little bit bias into the panel process, right? So if this organization that's doing great work and they're asking for 25,000, if you see that they got $5,000 last year, there's a little bit of a bias implicit in that in saying, oh, okay, well maybe we'll give them 5,300 this year. <laughs> Instead of saying, we want to, we support this, or this uh, application 90%, so we're going to give them $23,000 or something like that. 
Um, and then awarding, awarding the money, looking at multi-year funding. NISCA does it, why can't the DCLA? Um, if you're interested in being a part of this small group drafting this proposal, please let me know in person, or uh, you can email me at aduffy at jackny.org. But also, there may be other people already working on this, and I would love to hear about those, those folks. So um, that's it. Thank you so much. Question. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, what the, we, got, we did get money from Brooklyn Arts Council our first year. Uh, the maximum amount we could get was $5,000. We got $2,500, which was a third of our rent for a month. Um, so it didn't go very far. But if, if there was a significant increase in the Arts Council ab ability to fund, I'd be all for that. Thanks, everyone. Multiple mics. Hey, everybody. My name is Dawn Crandall, AKA Miss Aurora Bubrialis. I come to you as a part of the burlesque community in New York City. Um, shout out to Brad from Living Theater who sort of was like, hey, I don't think there's gonna be any blessed people here. You should come and say something. So I almost got scared and was like, oh, I'm just gonna sit here and listen to all these people. But I don't know if I per se have any recommendations, but I just do wanna speak to burlesque and nightlife and drag and a lot of things that are brilliant in New York City after hours that we and many of my colleagues do completely unfunded on shoestring budgets of our closets and things are brilliant. And there are people that I think come out of that and then go into larger, obviously you all know Taylor Mack who works with a lot of burlesque performers and stuff like that. But for every person who is figured out how to get funding, there's like hundreds more in the New York City cityscape that are putting on not just bar shows, but brilliant theatrical pieces that often I think, like my own, tr oh, yeah. Um, I am co-founder of Brown Girls Burlesque, an all-women of uh, color burlesque troupe. I'm no longer in BGB. I started with two other people now, Brass Brown Radical Ass Burlesque, recognizing that just because one is of color doesn't necessarily mean they are radical, so we had to name that in our new troupe. Um, but I want, and we brass, we've gotten a little bit of funding. Um, we live in lower Manhattan um, from LM, oh, alphabets, you know what I'm saying. I know, I was like, I was about to say, not the community. I'm seeing, we've gotten some funding and we were able to do a show two years ago and actually have budget to get props and costumes and pay people. And oh my gosh, it was amazing. And but I think very often in the burlesque community, people don't even realize that there's 
funding to be had. So I don't know, I guess I just wanted to force myself to come up here and say that there's this whole aspect of creative arts in New York City that is so even not even thinking about how to get funding. And I literally was on a New York City um, Facebook burlesque performer group. I was like, hey, anybody want me to say something? I'm going to this meeting. Shout out if you want me to say something. Um, <laughs> they were like, yay, go. Okay. Um, so more, I mean, one thing also is speaking earlier about the, from 2005 on, just the, the venues that keep closing. That's a thing that is affecting everyone in New York City. But as burlesque pr producers tend to be independent and tend to be performers themselves and tend to not have a lot of finances, so the amount of places that we can go and present shows keeps shrinking, and that's a big thing. Also, theater and bar spaces that are actually accessible um, is a big issue for trying to be inclusive as possible and not in, in being able to get wheelchairs in and on. So that's a big thing. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't have any necessary recommendations, but I just wanted to, to speak and, and yeah, force myself to, to say hello and to name this whole part of the arts community in New York, so. If anyone wants to say anything or questions, which is fine. Um, if no one asks, isn't there also still a law about dancing and drinking or it's against, what can you t tell about the that? Uh, <laughs> I haven't been, if anyone can speak to like the, the old cabaret laws that obviously during Giuliani period were like getting actively enforced and I haven't been paying attention of if that's been in the past bunch of years. I mean, I know in the late nineties, like it was definitely more active as part of Reclaim the Streets and we were doing a lot of protests and around, there was issues of, yeah, you couldn't have a certain amount of people in a bar dancing. And so anybody know if that has shifted? Anyone, anyone? I don't know. I'm like, I have a five-year-old. It's still it's active. It's still active, it shouldn't be, yeah. Right, right. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that should be changed. Yeah. yeah. So there's so much stuff. But thank you for your time. Yeah. Some, recommendation around, uh, some recommendation around um, getting resources or information about resources mm. that the city provides mm. to different uh, art fields, right? So it's not just that we're reaching out to uh, theater, dance, music, and visual arts venues but that there's some sort of outreach about resources in the nightlife community, in puppetry, in, the, you know, in pl uh, people that maybe are working in these smaller venues that somebody else was speaking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's also something about like, you know, because burlesque goes into adult entertainment and there's this sexy atmosphere and, and things. So I think that also still can in some ways be a stigma, like, oh, that's not serious art. You're getting half naked or whatever. Um, so, yes. yes. Well, <laughs> I know. Content, they're not supposed uh, content, to judge exactly. content either. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Alfredo Hernandez. Um, I'm program manager at The Field, which is an artist services organization um, in Manhattan. Um, uh, I'd like to speak uh, specifically about students uh, today. Um, I know, <laughs> since we're at CUNY also, um, I have a passion for arts education, um, but also thinking about um, the role this cultural plan um, can have in educating, oh sure, in educating um, future artists, right? Artists who are kind of being put through the either uh, however you like to think about it, BFA, MFA, Mill. Um, uh, and, and we did have a breakfast about this last, uh, earlier this month. Um, uh, thinking through um, how we're preparing um, 
students in, in the city of New York to navigate this sector. Um, and I think the cultural plan, um, uh, you know, I gave a talk at a, a pretty prominent university which will go nameless. Um, the program will go nameless as well. But the students had absolutely no idea. <clears throat> and they were advanced um, uh, conservatory students. Had no idea, um, one, what a 501c3 uh, organization was. Um, two, that this cultural plan was underway. Um, and three, uh, that there was a Department of Cultural <laughs> Affairs. <laughs> so, um, or how to navigate all of that, you know, um, in giving an hour long talk and trying to download all of this knowledge, um, I think um, this cultural plan um, uh, does have the ability to provide some grounding for the next generation of artists as well and, and arts workers um, by preparing them to enter this sector thoughtfully and, um, um, critically, so that's my spiel. Any questions or remarks? And people outside of arts education, um, you know, in higher education as well, people who can't afford to go through a BFA or MFA program. I think there could be more um, resources out there on a DCLA site or within the cultural <coughs> plan uh, worked in um, towards programming and towards resource development on um, uh, creating resources on how to navigate this sector and in this city specifically. I guess my question is, uh, sorry, is uh, like, yeah, specific recommendations, because I think one of the things I hear the DCLA saying is we, we give away money or we give money. Um, they probably have some resources on their website, but what would you, um, and they can obviously push money towards things as well, right, like the CIG internship initiative, but what would you recommend to meet the goal, to meet the, to solve the problem that you're suggesting that the DCLA do as a, primarily as a funding organization? I think more public presence, maybe, more public events, um, so we know who our, our cultural representatives are and, um, you know, that, that younger artists know, you know, who they are, who to tap into, you know, who to call, who to vote for, <laughs> things like that. Um, I think that's one way but that's a good point about funding. Um, but uh, I would say students, you know, coming straight out of school um, wouldn't necessarily know even how to go about getting money, public monies, or, you know, especially if you don't know what a 501c3 is, you're kind of <laughs> working at a deficit already. So that's just my point of view. Well, as somebody who our group has looked into becoming a 501c3 and just hearing now about 501c6, um, we've looked at what the, you know, n the advantages and disadvantages are. And one of them is that it's extremely complicated to do um, and is a lot of time that we don't have because we barely have enough time to run our organization. Um, are there opportunities for people who aren't in uh, the nonprofit world? Like, you know, how do people in that situation discover, you know, what are their best opportunities are? Is that something that um, has been addressed at all? I'm sorry, I wasn't here this morning, so I missed that part. Um, and I can do a shameless plug for our organization. <laughs> the field is actually um, a fiscal sponsor, um, one of the oldest uh, organizations offering fiscal sponsorship in the city. Um, uh, whereby the, f um, the organization becomes your sponsor um, and acts as your 501c3. You're, you're covered under our umbrella, so to speak, and you can fundraise um, and uh, apply for grants that way. Um, so that is one way, and I know that this Sunday at uh, New York Live Arts, there's a town hall about fiscal sponsorship being hosted by Dance NYC, the field uh, has been involved as well with other fiscal sponsorship um, organizations across New York. Um, there's some information, um, uh, let's see, I think it's, it's on Dance NYC's website, but um, uh, you have to register uh, to attend. Um, so that is one way, but uh, I think uh, a vast amount of young people who are just entering the arts sector as a whole aren't even aware of the different um, structures you can take on as an artist or as an organization so that you can function, um, right? As an independent artist, as a fiscally sponsored artist or a fiscally sponsored arts organization or as an artist collective or as a 501c3. 
Um, so, um, yeah, but I think that's something our educators uh, <laughs> need to be thinking about as well. So. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that. I'll be there Sunday night as well, and I uh, have fiscal sponsorship through one of your colleagues. Um, but um, as a bit of crosstalk with the previous question, just wanted to say um, that's what my organization did, figuring that there was a way of getting our non-for-profit toes wet without incurring a lot of the legal fees and, a lot, and especially a lot of the time that are consumed. It's worked out pretty well, and the way things are going, I, we may become you know a 501c3 of our own in the future, but it was a good way to, it's, it's a good, it's a good middle space, you know, in, in terms of involvement. So I, if you can go Sunday night, uh, sounds like a good thing. I'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm an artist and an art educator. Um, you know, we've been talking about funding and funding is always gonna be an issue. Um, so as um, an artist, uh, I'm thinking about ways to integrate cultures and as an immigrant too. Um, and how do, how do you integrate, I mean, why don't, you why don't we think about integrating cultures, sharing values and creating programs out of those? And I think we should address it more to the um, real estate, uh, I mean, people in the real estate business where they can open spaces for more of these activities to happen. So then the whole issue of funding probably wouldn't really come in, you know, where, um, I mean, I'll give you a small example of a project that I've been doing for the last four years. It is a community um, creative engagement project, which is um, about sharing the values of an Indian festival, um, but integrating the values with the contemporary life of New York City. Um, and trying to see people who are interested in the values of another culture and, and seeing if they can produce a cultural activity out of that. You know, it could be a designer, an artist, a writer, and then you just share and, and find collaborative spaces. Um, I mean, I've been working with Barnard University and, and a couple of galleries that open up spaces. Um, so I don't know, maybe the cultural plan and ideas of collaboration, like different kinds, and um, cross-cultural integration of cultures, of artists who can probably integrate with different cultures. Um, yeah. You want to say anything? Oh, I mean, um, I think it sounds great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I've, I've, I've been at a couple meetings where um, maybe speaking to that issue, um, is uh, putting together some kind of, and I think Brad, maybe we've talked about this at, at some of our own stuff, is putting together some kind of um, online resource where um, either the city would um, create this database of public spaces that are available for, or vacant, you know, for X amount of time and available for use um, on a first come, first serve basis or permit basis or something like that. So like a centralized hub. Uh, yeah, um, so that that kind of addresses the space issue a little bit, um, but yeah. Thanks. Any anybody else? I I, I noticed some other people have, have ducked in. Um, you're free to come up and share your views about the work that you or your organization are doing, or um, specific points that you would like to um, address publicly about the plan or make recommendations about the cultural plan to um, the Department of Cultural Affairs. This is being live streamed. If anybody else, or if you'd like to speak to any of the points you've heard today. No, crickets. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Thank you. And that concludes the afternoon portion, but there is an evening portion, the sharing of manifestos, cultural manifestos, which is such a cool word. <laughs>